Hello, my name's Jonathan James, and I was due to do the pre-concert talk tonight at St David's Hall, but as you can tell, I'm going to do it from my sitting room instead, because I'm afraid I have a stinker of a cold, and we all thought it better that I don't come and cough and splutter my germs over you all. So here instead are some thoughts that I was going to share with you uh, tonight on what makes French music sound French because it's a deliciously Gallic programme, isn't it, from the CBSO with Debussy and Ravel, some sumptuous classics. And it doesn't get more sumptuous, I think, than uh, Debussy's Prélude à l'après-midi d'un fond. What makes it sound French? Well, I'm going to start with the fact that Debussy, Ravel, and before them Satie and others were really being sort of argent provocateur at the turn of the century. They were trying to break away from the predominantly German-sounding world of classical music. And we think of Wagner in particular there, who had this kind of very tight grip on the sound of, uh, of music in the concert hall. And instead they're exploring exotic, interesting new worlds that function differently and they're radical and they're revolutionary. So one way in which Debussy's Prélude à l'après-midi was uh, revolutionary. It was just through the harmony and the way the harmony works. So you've got this lovely flute solo that wafts in like a perfume. Lovely expansive gesture there at the end and then a minor sixth chord, which by the way, the French composers seem to be drawn to like moths to the light. It's uh, just, it has a quality of a whole tone scale, nice fluid and exotic qualities, very bright in a way. And then what he does, he goes from that quite sharp chord into like that. I don't know if you can hear that, but that is a, that does that, makes you hold your breath and then oh, you sink into that B flat seventh chord. So even without all the theory, you've got ideas of light and shade governing the harmonic choice. And it's that sort of thinking that gave rise to all sorts of new possibilities harmonically. Interestingly, um, when you get this, <clears throat> that lovely theme, when it comes back, it's rethought of, it's cast in a different light every time. So it could be the next time it comes around, it's, Or sometimes, yeah, nice and bright. So each time it's a different refraction of the same idea purely by the harmonic colours that accompany it. And later on, uh, we get this idea. Now, in sort of previous times, you might have done something like... Debussy is led by his mood and the sense of spontaneity. And he does, and I love this chorus. It's not beautiful, it's lovely, ah, cool. And later on, you get Just creeping around in this very jazzy fashion. Does that sound quite jazz to you? I mean, he wasn't deliberately borrowing from jazz, but jazz was bubbling up in the nightclubs of Paris at that time, and you couldn't fail but just be interested and fascinated by these new sounds as a composer. And certainly Ravel was intoxicated by the sounds of jazz, and he brings it into quite a lot of his composition. I'm thinking particularly of the Piano Concerto in G that you'll be hearing tonight. Uh, the third movement is particularly filled with a jazzy joie de vivre. And, uh, well, let me just play you the first 30 seconds to give you a, a sense. Nice and busy, toccata. And then we have these shrieks in the woodwind. Thank you. 
boy, did you hear that? That's the spirit of jazz right there, the raucousness. It's absolutely uh, doubling with life, isn't it? And it's in two different keys at once, which is very jazz. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we have, sorry, that didn't sound very two keyish, does it? Say I have one key in my left hand and like that in the right hand, that's very jazz. Ravel loved that and he liked the colours of it and the spirit of it, the rebellious qualities. You can hear the boozy trombone there as well as the bebop style high, uh, you know, it almost sounds like a a squeaky saxophone there, doesn't it? And also he loved the more bluesy sounds of jazz. And you hear that in the second movement of that same concerto. So let me just pull this up on my iPad. This second movement, um, you can see why it cost him so much sweat, blood and tears. He says that this music came out of him drop by drop. He had to sort of squeeze it out. Um, and it cost him a lot of time and energy. You can see why, because it's so exquisitely crafted, and I'll come back to that thought in a second. But um, first of all, I mean, just to stick with the bluesiness of it, just listen to these chords. So we've got that, okay, and then... different very bluesy jazz chords going on there. Did you spot the that that kind of chord and then immediately he he goes down to uh, something like um, you know which is another jazz chord. So there are those inflections going on to make the second movement even more sensual than it already is and with Ravel we think of another French word, chic. You know, I really think that this piano concerto and quite a lot of Ravel's music has a chic allure to it. It's rather like a Coco Chanel tweed jacket. You know, you're at once entranced by the buttons and the, the weed of the tweed, but also it's the simple elegance of the piece that attracts you in the first place. And, you know, just sticking with this second movement, there is an apparent simplicity to it when it starts. And you think, okay, so it's a nice French waltz, but then you get this. Another waltz happening in the right hand, half the speed of the left. And it's, it's so clever, you know, to maintain that double speed of waltz, two waltzes happening at the same time throughout the entire movement in such an imaginative way is a real testimony to um, Ravel's vision but also craft, you know, he, he loved the detail. And just as you don't necessarily instinctively feel drawn to hugging a very chic person, do you? Um, so there's a certain aloofness, I find, a certain detachment with Ravel's music. His miroir for piano solo were referred to as Debussy on ice. So there's this detachment as if you're just observing a very, very beautiful scene. And in fact, when it comes to his ballet, Daphnis and Chloe, you'll be hearing a suite from that tonight. Um, it was based on a wonderfully plush fresco by the Rococo painter, Watteau. And when you listen to this music, let me just play it to you, just the opening. This is sunrise being depicted. You get a sense of that wonderfully large vista that is opening up in front of you. Can you hear that? <coughs> so just fluttering woodwinds and the harp there. 
the streams of sand and the celesta as well. But it immediately feels like a, a large framed piece, doesn't it? And you'll be drawn into the detail while also appreciating the larger frame. As I say, like a Rococo painting. And yet it's also wonderfully sensual music because within that there is so much detail to revel in, you know, and each bar your ear is caressed by what's happening in the texture. If I just, you know, open at random something, you look how much black notes there are, you know. Um, every bar in order to create that wash of sound, something that sounds so apparently free and easy, there's a lot of ink. And you sense that when you listen to Ravel, this tension almost between the detail of the score and the apparent simplicity and uh, spontaneity of the overall uh, visual quality of the picture. And with that, I come to my final thought, really, which is the main aesthetic that was governing the whole era around the turn of the century was one of the correspondence of the senses. So the symbolist poets of the time, um, I mentioned Mallarmé, you know, Baudelaire, Verlaine, um, Rimbaud to a certain extent, they were all trying to, through their poetry, get beyond just the visual element of the world and really dig deep into the sonorities involved so it would be delicious to the ear but also evoke a sense of perfume and incense so you could almost smell the words and also touch them you know there would be textures evoked so you get this correspondence of the sentences all of them coming together and Debussy and Ravel were trying to do the same with their music and that's why it's so ravishing you know it's so ravishing because it is, in its way, appealing to all of the senses. This is music that you can almost smell the perfume of. And the textures are so subtle that you're tempted to reach out and feel them. I sometimes joke that Ravel's music is the closest I would ever get to wearing silk pyjamas. <laughs> you know, just wafting in a breeze. So... Those are some elements, the freedoms, the new freedoms that were taken by the French composers, the provocative qualities, and I haven't really spoken about how erotic some of these scores were, and they were quite notoriously erotic, you know, particularly when combined with ballet choreography, which made it even more suggestive. And that's true for Debussy's Prelude à la Prémédi, which was premiered as a ballet almost 10 years after it was uh, a concert piece. And of course, for Ravel's ballet, the Daphnis and Chloe, is a very erotically charged ballet. So you have that provocative quality to the, the subject matter, but also to the sound and to the harmonies and their freedoms. And to this just invitation to listen in a new way, almost open your nose and your eyes as much as your ears when you... Uh, listen to the WC and Ravel tonight and, and you'll be in the right sort of place. Aside from that, well, it's down to a certain je ne sais quoi. Enjoy. <laughs>